Hello, my name is Glenn Atzid, and I'm sitting here with Frank Tichelli, and this is video number two of our discussion on his composition called Fortress. And in this video, what we're going to do is take you through really a, a, a thorough uh, look at the entire composition and give you a greater sense of, of how this was constructed. And, and Frank's going to play for a little, a little bit of the excerpts on the piano for us. And, and uh, we'll go through it measure by measure. So it'll be helpful if you have your score uh, as we look at this and shout out some rehearsal numbers and, and measure numbers for you to refer to. So I guess the very first part of it, of course, is, is the introduction and how you begin to introduce uh, what is the theme, but we don't hear that quite yet. It, it's introduced uh, by the percussion um, as sort of, in my view, I, I hear them sort of marching towards me a little bit, and you just begin to hear the, the snare drum and the very quiet cymbal. Um, and then that timpani comes in, and that timpani sets as, in, in my view, the mood for the entire piece. If, if those two intervals are wrong, on beats three and four. The whole piece is wrong, right? right? Because we have to hear that tritone. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, not only the tritone, but also the fifth at the top. That's right. The, the, the main theme is based on force, has that quartal, quintal harmony. So it's establishing both the tritone and also this fifth, fourth dominated uh, harmonic language. And just as I did for the play, in this piece, I'm also, before we have the main theme, I'm establishing a kind of mood. So it's done first with the percussion, and then the entrance of the, uh, of the timpani. Uh, the whole thing's transposed down a step. I've been playing this all in C, because that's how I had it for the play, but of course, for the, when I wrote it for band, the whole thing goes now down to B flat. So you've got that preceded by the percussion, and then finally the big entrance. Uh, first of the, the soldiers on their horseback, all of that business, and then you've got the main theme fourth bass, just these open fourths. And so that, already in the beginning, in these first few seconds of the piece, you've really got the basis for the whole piece. You've got the tritone and the bass line. You've got the seconds happening in this horse music, all this stuff. And then you've got the uh, perfect fourth bass main theme. Right, and then also um, you introduce right away in measure eight, uh, the call theme, as you, mm -hmm. you say, which is, I believe you said it was the wrong note mm -hmm. fanfare. Instead of, you've got. Yeah. And of course, that's a tritone between the G and the C sharp uh, in the, in the uh, principal right. trumpet there. Yep, the concert F to B, yes. And then we proceed farther, and we're now looking at measure 14. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of a sudden now the flutes come in with uh, something slightly different than we've heard before in terms of the marching music and, and the main theme. Mm -hmm. This. That's correct. Yeah, that's, a, that's foreshadowing uh, material that comes, becomes more prominent when we get to the second theme. But and it also feels like the timpani part mm -hmm. twice as long. That's right, augmented. Exactly. That's it. Exactly right. Exactly. All right, and now let's move forward. Uh, now we get to 18, and we have this flute and piccolo line that seems like that's extended from what just came. Is that, is that right? And that's also in the glockenspiel. That's right, in the glockenspiel and in octaves. And I always like that sound. You notice it's, it's written in double octaves. It's actually... That particular doubling the, the double octave, the 15th rather than the octave, it's always appealed to me. You know, jazz pianists do that all the time. You know, you get that sort of double octave thing. It's just that jazzy quality that has always appealed to me orally. Fantastic. And then we go to measure 22 now, and this is the first time that we get the legato theme, uh, right. the contrasting theme to, to the marching uh, horses. Uh -huh. And so that's a foreshadowing there. It's really, it, this section is not about this oboe lick. You've got that, but it's just foreshadowing. It's predicting the future in a way, what's gonna happen later. Exactly, now we get to measure 25, and we have these big, huge block chords. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those examples, I, I know where you stack the tritones, mm -hmm. and they become, in a sense, harmony uh, for, for the piece. That's correct. And then that leads us back into some more marching music at 28. And then at 34, 
uh, we get a little bit more of that legato theme that, that starts to, it looks like it's just adding a little bit more, a little more instruments, a little more volume, a little more presence, but still a foreshadowing? Yes, and so you see, even here, I'm starting to, to develop early on in the piece, because I've got the main theme sort of having the spotlight, but it's being answered by this foreshadowing of the lyrical theme in the clarinets. So again, the two together, and on top of that, that little galloping horse music as well. Yeah, and, and below that, so to speak, the, the tambourine that is, is playing mm -hmm. with that theme that's you know, still in our ears. So even though we hear that on the tambourine, I think we're still hearing pitches. Uh, as we begin to hear the, the rest of that music. Yeah. Um, now we get to uh, 38, and we have some of the, the call motive in the piccolo, uh, again, that sort of wrong note fanfare. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have this alteration between um, the, the oboes and the E flat saxophone, the alto saxophone, that mm -hmm. kind of go in, uh, yeah. well, they're, go they're, together. They're playing it, and, and, but then in contrast, the piccolo flute. So that, that call motive is now being imitated at the tritone. And then we start to get that same kind of imitation at 40 between the trumpets and the upper woodwinds. Bum, ba dum, bum, bum, ba dum, bum, bum, right? Correct. Kind of building on one another, mm -hmm. um, all the way up to kind of the first uh, major point, which is at 44. Correct. Where the, and then we start winding down a little bit. Right, at 44 we get the final sort of the final statement of the main theme, or at least a part of it here, just to sort of close it off. I'm closing out this section here. And then at 46, it starts to wind down. Mm -hmm. And I, as the band director, want to know why you would write C sharps in the alto saxophones. <laughs> they never play in tune. In tune. <laughs> and, and, and not only that, but, it's the C, but they're doubled by the oboes, so I'm I even know. adding more. There's, there's a certain tension that I want to be inherent in here. I know you can probably never get it perfectly in tune, so you're going to get a little bit of some beats, and it's okay, actually. Maybe this it, is why you don't conduct your own piece. <laughs> but I like, and also, the, the main harmony right in here is a, you know, this B flat. Uh, so you've already got a little dissonance there, and then on top of that, the E itself is not even in tune with itself right. perfectly. And I, I actually like this sort of beat quality that that comes out of it, the, you know, you hear the beats. Fantastic. It just adds to the, in, the innate tension of the main theme. So tell me now, as we go into this next section, which, you know, I think is, is one of the easiest sections on the page, but sometimes can cause the most difficulty uh, between these solos and the horns and the, and the flutes, mm -hmm. um, which then, of course, is abrupt at 54 and it's uh, you turn the page and all of a sudden you see what's about to happen and yes. it's a really nice moment. So yes. tell me about that transition into uh, 54. Yes, well it, it's interesting you say it's easy. I've had a lot of trouble with this. Yeah, it looks easy but it's hard. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and of course a lot of the uh, responsibility falls on the horn player's shoulders um, because it's muted and it's you know this wrong note thing at the top. And a lot of times young, young horn players have a little bit of difficulty with this. And again, it's, being, it's done at the tritone. The horn is here. And it's answered by the uh, flute. Right? So you've got this tritone relationship happening here as well. Just, and it's just, I don't even think of it as transitional as much as I think of it as a codetta to the main theme. It's, it's really saying goodbye to this first section and then without any warning, boom, we're at 54, yeah. where it starts to become more imitative. We've got this, this whole section from 54 to 70 is more about counterpoint. First a big tutti, um, imitative passage at 54, and then soloistic, more chamber-like, uh, four-part canonic writing starting at 50. Yeah, and that's, what, that's one of the things that I really like about the piece a great deal is at 59, it does feel like chamber music. It feels like an opportunity for for the students to really hear those four independent parts and kind of chase each other around. Mm -hmm. up Absolutely. So that's really fun. But all as right. a result, of course, again, this is a, can be a challenging section because now it's almost all about soloists here. Absolutely. And so then that sort of moves in to 71, right? Mm -hmm. and, and 71 is the point at which we start to get that other theme. Yes, but not without a tiny reminder of the main theme. That's in right. The uh, tambourine. 
Just a reminder of that before we go on to the second theme. And so this is the legato theme at 71 that you've referred to. And why don't you play a little bit of that for us? Okay, just sure. So we know what that sounds um, like. Well, again, as I mentioned in the uh, first part, uh, this theme really came out of just impro improvising. I was just playing around, again, with that tritone progression. And just, just making up things with my right hand and ended up with this. Also, rhythmically, I like that sort of offset quality. You've got the chord, and actually a bass line. You know, that sort of thing. So they're kind of in dialogue with one another in a way. The bass line on the downbeat, the theme entering on beat two. So they're not, instead of something like this. Together, I, there's right. just a slight sense of dialogue between the bass line. And then, of course, on top of that, I've added this uh, remind, the, what was the accompaniment for the main theme is now the accompaniment for the second theme. So again, I'm developing already at the very beginning of the second theme's appearance. I'm already developing. 